Okay, so um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how to work with GraphQL and a legacy system, which is probably what most of us are doing. Um, I don't know why I named this talk the way I did. I was like, oh, patching up an old ship to get a ship it. So it's like pirate themed now, um, but then like some of it isn't. So apologies, but we're just going to roll with it. So we have some Captain Jack Sparrow for like most of this. Um, so yeah. Uh, so if you don't know, um, my name is Sasha. I'm a software engineer at Twitter. Um, and I'm working on GraphQL. And I used to be the tech lead at Medium on the platforms team, also working on GraphQL. And yeah, I just want to talk about like working with legacy systems and GraphQL, since that's kind of what we all end up doing. I, no one real, usually has the uh, gets to work with GraphQL in just like a clean slate. I mean, that would be awesome. You know, if you're doing that, it's pretty cool. Um, but yeah, so I'm going to try to help you figure out how to get your legacy system seaworthy. Okay. Um, so most of the time, um, if you've seen any of the talks from like the GraphQL co-founders, um, usually you're working with a GraphQL gateway. So you have like your REST API, and then you plop GraphQL on top of your REST API. You have your clients query your GraphQL gateway, and the Gra GraphQL gateway will query, um, will call out to like your REST API, and then it'll call it to services, blah, blah, blah. Um, but let's just go through that if, in case we don't know what that is. So yeah, so you'll have like a client. And then you'll have your REST API. This is just what you probably have. Um, and the client talks to your REST API. Um, and then you have maybe a bunch of services. Maybe you don't. Um, let's see, you do. Um, your REST API will query, uh, uh, call out to those. And you might have some databases. And those call out to those. And then send the response back. Um, so with the GraphQL gateway, really quickly, um, you have your client. And you'll have your GraphQL gateway. So this is like your uh, Graph GraphQL server. Um, and then everything will go through that now. So your client will just uh, make one uh, call to the GraphQL endpoint. It'll hit your GraphQL gateway. And then that will make start making calls to your REST API. And that will make calls to probably your services and then probably some databases. Um, and then that all goes back up. Um, so this is like kind of like a common way to add GraphQL to a legacy system. Um, not everyone does this, but uh, we did this at Medium, and it's kind of what we do at Twitter as well. Um, this is like pretty normal. Um, so yeah, this setup is like pretty great if um, your REST APIs already return what your clients want. I mean, it's perfect. Um, you just everything's great. Nothing. You don't have to do anything. Um, but if not, which uh, see, now I got the Captain Jack Sparrow. Sorry, everyone. Um, but yeah, if not, then you might have to make some adjustments. Um, so probably your REST APIs aren't exactly perfect. Maybe that's why you're moving to GraphQL. You want to change some things around. Um, so some of the things uh, you might want to change are um, you want to include what the, actual, like, the client actually needs and wants. Um, and if you're starting to use GraphQL, um, this is kind of like your opportunity to make things nice, right? You, you're using GraphQL. You want to make things faster. Um, you want to be able to query things and give, what the, give the client what they want. Um, so this is like that opportunity. So you might as well change some things around instead of just like plopping something on top of an old system. Um, we also want to make, uh, make it in a format that makes sense. Um, so you don't want to just be like shoving whatever was in your REST API back over to um, your client. Um, because that might not be what they actually wanted in the first place, and now you have like these giant bloated objects. Um, so we want to make a response that for the client that's actually what they need, and in a format that makes sense for them. That's like not nested anymore if they don't want to nest it or you know group nicely or something like that. Um, and then also we kind of want to make this response small. Um, we don't want like this giant bloated object going across the wire now. Um, and if you just plop your GraphQL gateway on top of your REST API, that's like that might be what happens. Um, so we want to try to exclude things that the client doesn't actually need. Um, cool. So um, yeah, so this is easy uh, if you can just wholesale just change your API responses. Um, so if you're, you're REST API, you can just change some stuff, and like there you go, and everything's perfect. Um, but usually people are kind of relying on your API, or maybe it's hard to change. Things take time. So uh, you might need to bootstrap the transition. Um, so. Let's talk about repos. Um, if you've seen me speak before, I've mentioned a while ago something about repositories, what I call repos. And um, they're kind of this cool intermediate step that you can take. Um, so I'll talk about them a little bit here. Um, so yeah, uh, a repo or a repository is sort of what you can think of as a data description that reflects what the clients want. So you have your schema for GraphQL, and you have your repo. 
um, which is sort of this intermediate step. And then you might have your actual data. So this is something, maybe it's like a protobuf or what lives in your database. Um, so there's like maybe three descriptions that are happening here. And um, so the cool part is we can sort of use these repos to shape our response from a REST API and then use that shape in our schema. So that'll be kind of this intermediate step. We'll have our data that's kind of like raw. We have this intermediate like repository step. And then we can use that uh, for our schema now. So instead of going straight from data to schema um, or from like your REST API, whatever's there to your schema, you have this intermediate place where you can start shaping your data and making it nice. Um, so let's kind of look at what we might have. Um, so here is a, we're doing this in Scala. I don't know. We did Scala at Medium. We're doing Scala at Twitter. So if you don't know Scala, it's, it's OK. It's not too like scary here. I'm not doing any like maps or anything. Um, so this is just a case class. You can think of it as a class. If you don't do Scala, um, yeah. Uh, so yeah, so we might have our user defined in this way. It could be like maybe it's a protobuf and this eventually gets turned into a case class or something like that. Um, but just kind of, you know, imagine, it kind of looks like this. You got a user, you got an ID, some user info, and that's kind of that's kind of weird. Um, and the username, a name, a created at, it's like a long, but then then maybe one time you're like, oh, we should have a timestamp, so you be want to name it created at, but you can't because there's already something name created at, so you have created at timestamp, and that's the timestamp. Um, and then you have this user info, I don't know why they have this, you know, you're, you join this company later, and this is already here. Um, so there's this user info object, and it has like a name and a first name and a middle name, and like the first name, middle name, last name is what you actually want, but um, I don't know, it's in this user info-like object. So you can imagine that you have something like this. It's not perfect, but this is what you have and you're using it. Um, so if we use GraphQL and we just derive uh, our schema from, from this, um, we might get something like this in the end. Um, and then this other user info type. So this is kind of a lot. And what will happen is like, this is what your schema is, and this is like what the client's going to get. Um, and they can query this, and that's fine, but this isn't, you know, this isn't perfect. Um, and this is kind of your opportunity to make things nice. Um, so there's like, yeah, there's just like a lot of garbage in here. It's like stuff that's weird and old, and we didn't change anything. Um, we just kind of like plopped our GraphQL gateway on top of a REST API, and this is what we get. Um, so if it's possible, it would be cool um, to change our, our response here, and we can use that with a repo object. So uh, repositories are something that can live in um, your GraphQL server, so your gateway, and it's not business logic, so we can do that. Um, so let's imagine again, uh, we have this case class, and, and let's, let's make our repo object now. What would that look like? Um, so we have the same stuff. So let's just get rid of that whole thing. I mean, what, what was even that? It was stupid. Um, and then get rid of this, um, get rid of that, move that around. Cool. We don't need the created at timestamp. We'll, we, we want the timestamp, but we'll change it later. And then we can move this in there. And then we can actually just uh, change this to the timestamp. Now it's name created at. Um, so now, now this is kind of looking more like what the client actually wanted. They actually cared about the first name, middle name, last name. That's like the new way of doing it, I guess. And then. Um, we have no more name that was, we didn't need that. And the created at is now a timestamp instead of long. Um, so you can imagine that like, you know, there might come a point where you want to change things around and make it a little bit nicer. And now we have that. So you can imagine this is our new user object. This is our repository object. We couldn't change it at the service level. So we're changing it here. Um, and now anything that queries our GraphQL gateway, um, we'll get this nice object back. So if we derive this um, or use this in our GraphQL gateway, this is like the GraphQL SDL that we'll get back. Just a user, and there's no, nothing weird in there now. It's very simple, and it's actually what our clients wanted in the first place. Um, so that's pretty cool. That's right. Um, so yeah, so it's what our client actually wanted. Um, the format is much easier to reason about. We can actually see what's going on. Um, there's not something called user info. That didn't make sense. Um, and it's much, much smaller. It's not like this weird bloated object that sends like a bunch of crap that no one wanted back. Um, so that's pretty cool. So that's one thing you can do. But um, so like, what if we send back a lot of data, but some of the data is actually useful? So I showed you a bunch of stuff, and it was just like garbage in there. So it wasn't useful, so we could remove it um, and use our repo object. But what if it's actually useful? Um, so at Medium, we called these references. You might call them something else. Um, but it's basically like data that was related to what you requested. Um, and it might look something like this. 
So you may have seen this, I don't know what you call them wherever you work or whatever, in whatever you do, but say we have something, um, you, you hit your REST API, you get this response back, you ask for a post, and a post has an ID, some text, go get a Pikachu, when it was created in an author ID. And then it, along with this response, there's like a references section, and there's an ID, there's like a map, and there's an ID that maps to the user, the author of this post. So you have like this references section, the ID, and then you have like the user who actually created the, the post. And that's kind of included along in the response because you were probably going to ask for it anyway. And um, a lot of times, like before GraphQL, uh, there's probably something in place where you work or if you were doing a system like this to help with extra calls like that. Um, at Medium, we had something like that. It was built in-house. Um, but it was probably a GraphQL-esque thing. Maybe it wasn't exactly the same. Um, maybe it was at a different layer. But basically, there's probably something that was baked into a service, um, and it would be expensive to try that out now. Um, but it was helping with these extra calls. It was trying to, it's like, oh, I already know that you're going to get a user, so I might as well do it now. Um, so the problem is, if you plop GraphQL on top of that, that might cause some problems. Um, so, right, for with our, our old REST API system, um, what would happen is, you know, we're making some calls and stuff, and this call, you're like, okay, I'm asking for a post. It has an author, um, so I'll get the post. Can you see that? You can kind of see that. So you, you ask for that post, and it's like, actually, I'm already here. I'm going to get that user that created that post as well, and then um, we're just going to send that back to the client. Cool. So that's pretty normal. Um, cool. Yeah, and so with the GraphQL gateway, you might make a query like this. So same kind of thing. You're making a query, post by ID. You can ask for ID, text, and author. And then the, inside the author, you're actually asking for the ID, the username, and the first name. So if we're using a GraphQL gateway, um, this, this call graph looks a little different. Um, and it's not ideal. So now we have our, our system now with our GraphQL gateway. Our client is making that one like to the GraphQL endpoint call. Um, and it might make some other calls to do other things in the query. Um, but it's going to make this call to our database. It's going to get the post. And then it's also going to get the user, because this is on top of our old system. So it's also getting the author. But the problem is we're going to send this back. It's going to send the whole thing back, this big bloated object. Um, but in our response for GraphQL, we're not actually going to use this user. It's just like we asked for it, and it got it all because it's on top of our legacy system, and we don't actually end up using that user at all because GraphQL doesn't know about it. So that's really lame because guess what happens? Then you still are going to make this call to resolve the user. But we could have just gotten it already because it's on top of our old system that was kind of already handling this sort of thing. Um, so then we'll get our user and then send that back. So I, I don't know if any of you have dealt with this before. At Medium, we did. Um, so guess what? That's like super slow. It's so slow um, because you're making like extra calls. It's like you do all this work, and your system's already doing all the work to get the post and the user, sends it back. We just ditch the user, and then we go get the user again. And um, so this is especially terrible if you're like trying to sell GraphQL to your company and you're like, hey, GraphQL is so awesome and fast. And you're like, put the Gra GraphQL gateway on top and then you're like, check it out. It is slower than our old system. So you're like, cool, cool, yeah. And so once you kind of figure this out, this is exactly what happened at Medium when we started doing this. We're like, oh no, it's worse. Um, so the one thing you can do um, if you can't like migrate everything all at once, which you probably can't, um, is to actually use the references. This kind of sounds counterintuitive because you're like, well, I'm trying to get off of the old system. I don't want to like use the same stuff. But this is kind of an intermediate step where you can kind of get away with doing some of this stuff, and then later you can get rid of it. So um, I heard talk of some caches. So something we can do is the per request cache. Um, I won't, I'm not going to go into super, like a lot of detail here, um, but it's possible. And I'm excited because it sounds like pe more and more people in the GraphQL community are getting to the point where we're talking about caching. Um, so yeah, so a per request cache it kind of is self-explanatory, but um, basically you put what's returned with your requested data in a per request cache. Yes. Let's hear more. Um, what's cool is this cache is a cache that doesn't persist um, between GraphQL query requests. So if you make one GraphQL query for a post and, a, and an author, 
um, and then you cache some information related to that, um, the next query you get is not going to have that same data in there. So it's not a persisted cache. It's just like you know in in a thread or like a process. Um, so that's cool. And then also you can have sort of like a global or a, like a subquery cache. Um, so it'll apply to subqueries. So you can have a global cache where you have this one big query, and you can cache some things in there. But maybe um, uh, if we talk about things like visibility, so like maybe you query something and you can't see, like a, somebody can't see um, like this post or something. Um, you can have like visibility filters for uh, different parts of your subquery. So you can actually cache things for this subquery, and then it only applies to that subquery, but then other things will apply to other parts. Um, that's a little more complicated, um, but it's also still possible. So I'm going to go through kind of very briefly what how this would look. Um, but again, it's just kind of like your like normal caching, um, and you can just do it in like a map or something. Um, so this is what we had before. We had our post, and we had our author, and all the references, and we had our user that was stored in those references. And again, there might be like a ton of information in here. This is a very simple example, but I mean, there's a bunch of other crap in here too, and it's just like this huge object. Um, so what's cool with this caching now, like any cache, um, we can just like store it in our cache, all of the references information, and then pull it out later for use in our resolvers. Um, so then this, if we kind of morph it into our, our per request cache, we get something that looks like this. Um, you can do whatever you want with this, um, but this is just keyed by the ID, and then it's just stored in this like map. Um, and basically when we resolve, this means that we can uh, pull it out of here. So for example, um, we can add entries from this references thing to a global cache or, um, or attach a cache to a field context. So this would be like for subquery caching. You can attach it to just specifically that context for a field and then basically look it up from the cache when we're resolving. Um, some libraries for GraphQL uh, already have this mechanism built in, which is super sweet. Uh, Sangria already has it built in. Um, and it's mostly because I whined about it. I was like, please, someone build this. And then they did. Um, but some libraries may not have this. But it, it's not too bad because um, it's not that hard to build. At Twitter, we happen to not be able to use uh, Sangria's built-in mechanism for this. And so we just built our own. Um, and it works. Um, so don't fear. Um, this is more Scala code. Um, but this is kind of an example of uh, how you'd use this in Sangria. Um, so basically, you have like. Uh, there's a concept of fetchers. This is just kind of how Sangria like uh, gets things. Um, but we're going to say, hey, we're going to have a fetcher. It's like caching with context fetcher, we're passing in our context and our user, um, which is just our uh, data representation. And then uh, we have our post fetcher, which is also a caching with context fetcher. Um, and basically, we're able to load the posts by IDs, which is just our normal like grab the uh, all the posts. Um, but then we're saying, hey, if you see anything in there that looks like a user, pull that out, put it in this cache, and update the cache. Um, so yeah, so Sangria has a mechanism for this. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if maybe other libraries do too. But if not, you can just make a, a simple map um, and have that uh, just persist there in the process. Um, and it's not too bad at all. Um, so yeah, so if we do something like that, as you probably figured out, um, the normal uh, resolution stuff goes on as normal with our, uh, when our client hits the GraphQL endpoint. But when we do this whole step, we're going to get the post and the user as normal. And uh, it's going to send back the whole thing. And that's it. We'll just use it. So because we're using that information from the cache and it was stored in the cache, we don't have to like do that whole other call and go through everything again. So then it actually is fast. Um, so that's pretty sweet. Um, so like I kind of mentioned, these sort of things aren't necessarily meant to sit around in your system forever, um, but they can be really useful when you're sort of in an intermediate step. You're trying to like migrate from your old system to a new system. Um, and they work for when you need them. Um, but yeah, not, not necessarily meant to ex ex exist forever, but they, they can. Um, but yeah, they, they definitely can work as a way to make working with this like legacy system that you're most definitely building on uh, a lot easier. So with some work and some cleverness with your transition to GraphQL and a bit of savvy, can get an old ship sailing again. Um, thank you, everyone.